أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لام را تلك آيات الكتاب المبين إنا أنزلناه قرآنا عربيا لعلكم تعقلون نحن نقص عليك أحسن القصص بما أوحينا إليك هذا القرآن بما أوحينا إليك هذا القرآن وإن كنت من قبله وإن كنت من قبله لمن الغافلين إذ قال يوسف لأبيه يا أبت إني رأيت أحد عشر كوكبا يا أبت إني رأيت أحد عشر كوكبا والشمس والقمر رأيتهم رأيتهم لي ساجدين قال يا بني لا تقصص رؤياك على إخوتك فيكيدوا لك كيدا إن الشيطان للإنسان عدو بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد I welcome you all to the first of a series of حلقات that we will have about the tafsir or the explanation of one of the most interesting, one of the most powerful, one of the most moving surahs in the entire Qur'an, and it is the Surah Yusuf, the Surah of Yusuf alayhi salam. This Surah, Surah Yusuf, is a very, very unique Surah in the Qur'an. It is a one of a type of Surah. Firstly, it is the only place in the Qur'an where the story of the Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam is mentioned. There is no other surah that mentions the story of the Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam. Now if you compare this to let's say the story of the Prophet Musa. The Prophet Musa alayhi salam, his story is mentioned in over 25 different locations. The story of our father Adam. The story of Adam alayhi salam is mentioned in over half a dozen locations, right? The story of Isa, almost a dozen times. But the story of the Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam, it only exists in this surah. In fact, even the name of the Prophet Yusuf, it only occurs once or twice in passing, just in passing. Surah An'am mentions the name of Yusuf. Surah Ghafir mentions just the name of Yusuf. But there's no story at all. So the stories about what happened with Yusuf alayhi salam, it only occurs in this particular surah. Secondly, it is the only surah in the Quran that has a unified story as its theme from the beginning to the end. The whole surah is nothing but a story. And there is no other surah of length in the Qur'an. We're not talking about the small surahs at the end of, of Juz Amma. We're talking about any surah, uh, basically more than 10 ayat, 15 ayat. There is no surah in the whole Qur'an that is a unified story from the beginning to the end. And this is something we all know. That read Surah Baqarah, read Surah Ali Imran, read Surah Yunus. You will mention and find the stories of lots of people. One paragraph, one page, sometimes even five pages. But there is no place in the whole Qur'an where an entire 15 pages is dedicated to one story. So it's a chronological story from the beginning to the end. And this is not just very rare, it's unique. There's no other place like it in the whole Qur'an. Now this story, this surah, it was revealed 
We don't know the exact date, but we know roughly around 10 or 11, uh, not of the Hijrah, but of the years of the Da'wah. In other words, the Hijrah, of course, we begin the Medinan phase. Before the Hijrah, what do we call it? Some scholars use the term BH, before Hijrah, right? Just like the Christians have AD and, and, and BC, uh, so Muslims have AH and BH, right? So if you look at BH, so 1BH means one year before the Hijrah. 2BH, two years before the Hijrah. So the Yusuf is revealed around 2 or 3BH. In other words, right at the end of the Meccan era, the Meccan message. Now, the timing of revelation is very crucial here. Surah Yusuf was revealed after the famous year called year, the year of sorrow, the year of regret, the year of difficulty, Am al huzn In this year, three things happened, one after the other, which were the most painful for the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And there was no time in the seerah where the Prophet ﷺ was more demoralized, if you like, than this period. And that is why the scholars of seerah call this era, this period, they call it Am al Huzn, the year of grief. He was sorry, he was feeling grief throughout that year. What happened and what makes it worse, one after the other, these three things happened. The first of these three devastating things was the most personal and the most intimate, and that was the death of Khadija. Khadija alayhi salam was his supporter. Khadija alayhi salam was his moral, uh, if you like, uh, source of strength. And as they say, behind every great man there is a great woman. Be this is exactly applying to the Prophet ﷺ and Khadija. That Khadija was his source of comfort and support whenever anything happened. Even when the wahi came down and he was scared, what did he do? He went running back to Khadija ﷺ to be calmed down. Zammiluni, zammiluni, cover me up, cover me up. So Khadija was his source of comfort, his source of support. And when a man has that comfort inside the house, when he has that love, he is able to face a lot outside. And when that is deprived of him, then the problems outside become more difficult to bear. So the death of Khadija was something that was very difficult for him. Within five, six weeks, a second death followed. And that was the death of his uncle, Abu Talib. And Abu Talib was his support in society. Abu Talib was the one who sacrificed his own reputation, his own prestige, in order to protect the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Abu Talib was the one when the Quraysh came to bribe him, the Quraysh came to threaten him, the Quraysh came to intimidate him. And initially he was scared. Initially he, he, he went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, do something, stop doing this. You all know the famous story, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if they were to give me control of the sun and moon, I wouldn't give up what I'm doing. So Abu Talib said, O oh, son of my brother, O oh, my nephew, do as you please, I'm never going to come to you again to tell you not to do this. And he was a man of his word for 10 years. Not once did he approach the Prophet ﷺ after that. After this incident of the sun and moon, when he said, if they were to give me this, I would not give up. Not once did Abu Talib ever come and say, why did you do this? Look what now, what, what do I have to face now? You know, look now I have to tell my, my cousins, my relatives, what you have, not once. He was a man of his word. And Abu Talib did everything he could, so much so that when the Quraysh boycotted the Prophet ﷺ, and they said, you must leave Mecca, and he went with the Muslims and with Bilal and with all of them to live in the valleys outside of Mecca, Abu Talib was not a subject of that boycott because he's a pagan, he's a Qurashi, he's a, he's a mushrik. Abu Talib was not a part of the boycott, but because he was a part of his nephew, he loved him so much, he voluntarily, he was the only non-Muslim to live with the Muslims at the time of boycott. The only non-Muslim who voluntarily gave up his privileges, his house in Mecca. He gave up everything and he suffered along with the Muslims because he felt this is injustice. And he felt I have to do this as the uncle, as the protector and he did everything he could. And as long as Abu Talib was alive, they could not do anything else to harm the Prophet ﷺ. With his death, that was when the persecution reached its max. And that's why eventually he had to leave to Medina. Because he couldn't live in Mecca anymore. So Khadija was his internal support in the house. And Abu Talib was his external support in society. The both of them, one after the other, they died. And this was a very difficult time for our Prophet ﷺ to make matters worse. He suffered the single most uh, if you like, depressing or most difficult day of his whole life after the deaths of Khadija and Abu Talib, as if there could be no law, there was one law after that. And that was the incident of Ta'if. The incident of Ta'if. Aisha radiallahu anha said, O Messenger of Allah, was there any day that was more difficult for you to bear than the day of Uhud? Was there anything that was more difficult than Uhud? He said, yes. 
Aisha was too young to know anything about Makkah. Aisha doesn't remember Makkah. So she knows Badr, she knows Uhud, she knows Tabuk, she knows it. So she knows the problems of Medina. So she knows the worst problem of Medina was what? Was Uhud. So she asked, was there any day that was more difficult to you than Uhud? Immediately, without thinking, without, he knows what's his most difficult day. He said, yes, the most difficult day for me was the day when I was rejected by the brothers of Abdi Ali, meaning the chieftains of Ta'if. And you all know the story, and we'll talk about it in a lot of detail, inshallah, in our other lectures that we'll start about the seerah, uh, that the Prophet ﷺ was humiliated, and he was publicly uh, scorned, and the children of Ta'if uh, went uh, stoning him. This day was the most difficult for him. Now these three incidents, they occurred within six weeks of one another, within two months, one after the other, as if things could not get any, any, any worse, basically. At this point in time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Surah Yusuf. And when we understand this frame of revelation, all of a sudden the significance of Surah Yusuf increases many times. Why? Surah Yusuf is meant to uplift his spirit, sallallahu alayhi wa It's meant to console him. It's meant to strengthen him. At a time of such trial, tribulation, Surah Yusuf is going to be his light that will lead him out of this depression. Of this, when I say depression, of obviously the Prophet is not suffering from depression, but we mean it's a depressing time. It's a time of pain. It's a time of anguish. And this is hope for us. When we are feeling down, when we are suffering from problems of society, this is the surah we can turn to, to get an uplifting moment, to get some solace and comfort. That's why Allah revealed it to our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Scholars also mention that uh, a, number of, a number of incidents happened that also led to the revelation of this surah. Of these incidents is, as the persecution of the Muslims increased, and the Sahaba in Mecca were feeling more and more overwhelmed by all of the pressures. They came to the Prophet ﷺ and they said, O Messenger of Allah, why don't you tell us the stories of those before who also suffered? Why don't you tell us what happened? Uh, give us some qasas, give us some stories of the people before. And so when they wanted these stories, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, perfect timing, when the persecution reaches its maximum, and that is why the hijrah occurs two years after this surah, right? Two years after the surah, the hijrah occurs, because you cannot live in Mecca anymore. They will literally, it reached, as you know, the night before the hijrah, they were going to kill him, sallallahu alayhi wa they, they, they sent out an assassination squad, surrounded his house, 50 people, that's it, end of story, right? Had it been anything other than the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that is the end of Islamic history. But Allah miraculously saved him. So, one of the direct causes of revelation was the fact that the Sahaba wanted something to uplift their spirits as well. Another direct cause of revelation, it is said that the Quraysh, they wanted to try to outwit the Prophet ﷺ and wanted to show that he's not truly a Prophet. And so they sent a delegation to Yathrib, to the Yahud of Yathrib. And they asked the Yahud of Yathrib, Yathrib of course is the name of Medina before it is Medina. They asked the Yahud of Yathrib, tell us a question that only a prophet would be able to answer. Give us a trick question that we can show once and for all that this man is not a prophet. Tell us a question you know the answer to, but nobody else knows. Now, even though the Yahud were a different religion than the Quraysh, the Quraysh felt that the Yahud were superior because of their book. The Quraysh did not have a holy book, right? The Quraysh did not have a scripture. The Quraysh did not have a revelation. And the Yahud had a revelation. So the Quraysh felt this, this sense of inferiority, that you Yahud are the people of the book, and you know knowledge we don't know. And you believe in prophets, we don't, we don't know any prophets amongst us. So you tell us something. So they went to the, the Yahud, and the Yahud said, ask him about the story of Yusuf and his brothers. Nobody knows this. And by the way, this is an interesting point, we're going to come to this uh, again. In Mecca, there were no Christians and Jews. In Mecca, there were only idol worshippers, idolaters, pagans. There were no centers of Christianity and Judaism. There were one or two private